Let us see the commonalities and the differences in histogram and bar graph. What type of data can be represented using histogram? It is numeric, the group data, we have seen the data has to be group, ungrouped data cannot be represented here, here for histogram we need class interval and we also need its midpoint. Whereas in bar graph we can use discrete data which is ungrouped and we also can use non-numerical data for representing using the bar graph. If we are talking about the order of categories, we will see in histogram it is numerical data, so numerical order and we also see it from left to right. So, we start from 0 and it goes on increasing, plus on right hand side and minus on left hand side. In bar graph, it is numerical order if the data is discrete or it is numerical, of course it is also from left to right, but if it is non-numerical, we have seen that order does not make sense because it is category. So, the sequence is not important, you can arrange it the way you like, that is not the case about histogram, there is a definite order. We have also seen whether the bars touch each other, in histogram they do, but in bar graph they do not touch, because every bar is separately shown standing on the x axis. You also can see where you want to label them, the graphs, we have seen on bar graphs it can be on the top of it. Whereas, in histogram, the midpoint is written below the x axis, you have shown the point and below that the midpoint is written and of course, on y axis we have the frequency for both the types of graphs. Now, you know that which graph to be selected for what kind of data and how you want to represent your data in graphical form. Let us see one more type of graph which is called pie chart or pie graph. This also represents your full data a distribution, but it assumes that it is a circular arrangement, the representation is circular and you are showing a part of it of the circle as your data. So, you have the class intervals or you have the categories and from each category there is some data and there is a total, so it is 360 degrees. So, from 360 degrees how much weightage is given to this category, how much weightage is given to other category that is shown and if it is represented like this, it is known as pie graph. Let us see the example of pie graph. We ask the respondents, how often do you read a newspaper and we had 6 categories. You see in this pie chart, 6 categories are shown and their weightage is shown in terms of percentages. Even if you do not show it in terms of percentage, it is taken as percentage. You can show the actual frequency there. So, for example, never read 10, less often it is also 10. So, you can show 10 there, 10 is a frequency, but while preparing the pie graph, what we have done? We have taken it out of 360 degrees, because the circle is of 360 degrees and in terms of 360 degrees where this frequency stand. So, this is what the pie graph represents. You can see the maximum size of the circle is taken by the respondents who read the newspaper every day. Instead of only showing it, showing the percentage or the actual frequency near the part, we also can show the category title there. So, the second figure shows you that. Pie graph is also used for you can take it out. For example, you are interested only in those who read every day. So, you see the third figure, what is done here? Instead of showing the whole circle, this part is taken out. That is also possible. The pie graphs can be shown because today you have Excel software which gives you graph in a variety of ways, but we must understand the basic principle of it. It is talking about percentage in terms of 360 degrees. Now, let us see one more type of graph which is frequency polygon. The word polygon means many sided figure, but it is a polygon means it is a closed figure. That means, you cannot put the two ends in the air, they have to touch some base and that base is x axis. So, any frequency polygon will start from x axis will end at x axis, because x axis means 0 zero frequency and you do not have zero frequency in your distribution. So, we must get one more 
a class interval below the actual class intervals and we also must get one class interval above the class intervals because we have to have this frequency polygon touching x axis. Please remember this, this is a polygon, this is not an open figure, this is a closed figure. For frequency polygon also we will have x axis and y axis. On x axis we will show the midpoint and on y axis we will show the frequency. For this again you should have class interval, class interval then midpoint and also the frequencies. First you prepare that table and then you convert it into a graph that is frequency polygon. Now you know that you plot all these midpoints on the x axis, all the frequencies on the y axis and then for each midpoint you have you plot a point. All these points are connected by a ruler. So, you will have a straight segment of a line, but your frequency polygon, your class interval starts from some kind of a frequency. Let us see one example. Here in this distribution, the lowest class interval is 10 to 19. Now, if you plot the frequency, it will not be touching the x axis because it is not 0, it is a frequency is 25. So, it will somewhere in between the first quadrant. So, you have to take one more class interval below this. So, instead of starting from 10 to 19, we will start from 0 to 9. So, 0 to 9 means the frequency is 0. Now, the uppermost is 140 to 149. So, again this frequency also will be in the first quadrant it will not touch x axis. So, in order to bring it down to x axis, you will have to take one more class interval 150 to 159 and then its frequency will be 0. So, you connect that to x axis. Now, this figure is a closed figure which is known as a polygon because it has many sides. This also covers area of your distribution, but if you compare it with histogram, it does not cover exactly the same accurately the same area. Now, frequency polygon is showing you the area covered because all the frequencies are here. Can we plot mean and median on our frequency polygon? Yes, we do. We can do that because you know that mean, median and mode are measures of central tendency. They are also used to describe the distribution. Now, if you find your mean and median on a frequency polygon, you can show that. In this example, you are seeing a frequency polygon without mean and median and a frequency polygon with mean and median. You are seeing here that it is not exactly in the middle, it is a little on the right hand side and median is also not exactly in the mean because this distribution is not normally distributed. This is not a normal probability curve, this is a frequency polygon it can be normally distributed, it can be symmetrically organized, it can be, but presently this example does not show you that is why the mean and median of this frequency polygon are not at the center. We have seen frequency polygon and we have also seen histogram. Can we compare this when to use frequency polygon and when to use histogram? Because the researcher is interested in graphically representing the distribution, so he or she must know which one to use and when. Of course, it is at the discretion, but if it is more appropriate to use one, we should use one. We have already seen that histogram is accurately showing your area because the frequencies are perfectly taken care of. In a frequency polygon, you will see that frequency we are writing, but it is not correctly represented in the frequency polygon, but it looks good as compared to histogram. Histogram is a bars and they are touching each other. Visually, frequency polygon looks better. So, if you are not interested in accuracy of the area covered, then instead of using histogram, you can use frequency polygon. I have already said that the scores can be arranged symmetrically around the mean and if you, are, you have the scores symmetrically arranged, then your frequency polygon would look like a normal probability curve. Can you convert histogram into frequency polygon? Yes. See this example. What we have done? We have histogram. Histograms are bars starting from lower limit of the class interval to upper limit of the class interval, but it is based on the midpoint. Now, if you have midpoint and you have connected all those midpoints, what you have is frequency polygon. The only care which you have to take is bring that last one to the x axis. 
because it is a polygon and polygon has to have a close figure with many sides. So, we have seen that we can convert histogram into frequency polygon and the researcher is free to select which one he or she wants to use for representing the distribution of data. There is one more graph which is called cumulative frequency graph or cumulative frequency curve because it is a curve, it is not a straight line. Like polygon has sides, it is a line segment straight. This cumulative frequency does not have straight line, so it is a curve, so we can also call it a curve. But there is one more name to it, it is called OGIVE, O G I V E, OGIVE, cumulative frequency curve. Let us see one example. The same example which we had taken earlier 0 to 99, from 0 to 99 we have the last class interval as 600 to 699, frequency is given there. Now what is a cumulative frequency? That means we are starting at 0 to 99, the frequency is 35. So we are starting with 35, when you go up that means 100 to 199, the frequency is 63. What does that mean? If you take from 0 to 190, how many people are there? That means 35 plus 63, that is 98. So, at the point 199.5, how many scores below that? 98 scores below that. This is called a cumulative frequency of that class interval. When you go to the next class interval, that is 200 to 299 the frequency is 70. What would be the cumulative frequency? Cumulative means taken together. So, we are talking about 299 score below which how many scores lie? So, all three class intervals should be added together. So, cumulative frequency of 200 to 299 is 98 plus 70 that is 168. Like this in the last column we have cumulative frequency and what is the uppermost number that is 398 that means that is the n, total frequency is n that is 398. So, upper number should be the same as n. Now, if you plot a curve this would look like this, it is a curve because it goes on increasing and then it touches that highest peak point that is 398. You see it is a curve. And if you put a perpendicular from any point on x axis and on y axis, it will tell you how many scores lie below that point. While plotting frequency polygon and histogram, we use the midpoint. While plotting the cumulative frequency curve, we do not take midpoint, we take the upper limit of that class interval and that is why we get a curve. Now, the use of OGAVE is if you put a perpendicular from any point on x axis and on y axis, you will see how many scores lie below that and you know that this is a definition of percentile. Percentile point tells you how many scores lie below it, but it does not tell you only scores, it tells you the percentage of scores. So, 99 percent of the scores lie below this point. So, instead of frequencies if we take percentages, you will directly get a percentile rank or percentile score of a particular rank. This is the use of cumulative frequency curve or OGIVE. We have seen today variety of graphs which can be used by researcher to represent the distribution of data which he or she has received from using variety of tools. Now, this data can be represented in a distribution table or it also can be represented in a graphical form. If we represent it in graphical form, the reader gets to know because it is a visual, he or she understands the various features, characteristics of the graphical representation of the distribution. So, it is always advisable to use graphs, but certainly not to overdo that. For each small distribution without any purpose, if we start using graphs, then the reader also would not like this. We have to be judiciously using the graphical representation because it adds value to your describing or to your description of the data which you have collected. Thank you.